Welcome to the We Hack Purple podcast, where each week we interview a new member of the information security industry to talk with them about what it's like to do their job and what it's like, I guess, to try to get to that position within our industry and all the things you need to learn and how it's possible for you at home to do this. Um, we are sponsored this week by Ten Security, just like we were last week and the week before, our friendly friends from well, who are the creators of Defect Dojo? We Hack Purple is an academy, a podcast, and a community. And as of this week, our community is free. Go check it out at community.wehackpurple.com. But, oh yes, and I'm Tanya Janka. I am your host. I always forget to introduce myself. But you probably want to meet our guest, Deviant Olaf. So let's stop waiting and let's just do this. Let's bring him out. Hi. Hey, hey. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Hey, well, yeah, how is everybody doing? Do people want to say hi in the chat and tell us where they're from? Hi, Dave. Hi, Moo Moo. <laughs> so, it's a hard um, question nowadays when people say, where are you from? It's, you know, we, we basically just say our cats and our books live in Seattle, and that's about where we leave it when people ask us that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I mean, where are you streaming in from? Because... Mm -hmm. If you're traveling, it's cool to know where you're at. And if you're not traveling, it's still cool. Um, oh, and we're getting a lot of messages and that is mm -hmm. good, awesome sauce. So Deviant, or should I say Deve, which is better? Oh, Deve saves time and confuses other people because they think you're saying either Dave or Steve. So helps me on the phone with social engineering. Which brings me to, could you please tell us, so usually I say job title, but you run your own company. So yeah. like, how do you, how would you introduce yourself in your job title? How about that? Yeah, I mean, when you run your own company, it's never glamorous. You're either a professional email answerer or swear word sayer. But the people online who have ever heard of me probably know me with other titles that they sound equally made up, like physical penetration specialist, which was actually how I was billed on a TV show once, and it bumped with legal because they thought I was trolling them. And I was like, no, it's an actual thing, not a business card. Uh, yeah, those, who, those who've never heard of me, I am part of a covert entry team. I have been working with locks, safes, access control systems, and the like for a very long time. Um, both in terms of teaching people for the fun of it with like a nonprofit. There's a nonprofit called Tool, for example. Maybe people have seen the, the red logo with the three O's, right? So the open organization of lock pickers showing up at hacker cons and educational events. And I've been on the board of that nonprofit forever. But in addition to doing it as a hobby, uh, lock safes and the like are also my career. So I get to go around and I get to break into buildings and I get to run teams of people uh, you know, through surveillance operations in fields, putting eyes on target and then coming up with a plan and faking access control credentials and stealing alarm codes, you name it. Oh gosh, that sounds so fun. I mean, a few weeks ago, I accidentally locked myself on my patio and then I like opened the window and then kicked in the screen. Does that, it's not like that, is it? <laughs> you know, that is, that's pretty close. If it's, it might not be perfectly non-destructive entry, but if you can tidy it up and no one notices, it counts as covert entry. Oh yeah, yeah, I got in and um, I would say it was quiet, but it doesn't matter because I was the only one home because otherwise I would just knock on the door and be like, let me in, but everyone was out. <laughs> so I was like, am I gonna yeah, yeah. just, oh crap. <laughs> I was yeah, thinking, people think covert dinner. entry means you're a, yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. 
oh no, I was just thinking maybe I'll just stay out here and eat dinner and just like wait till people get home. But I was like, no, no, you can do this. Did you have your dinner? Were you like, did, was it as silly as like you went out the door to receive a delivery and then turned around and the door had shut? No, no, it was, I was barbecuing and someone oh. had locked the patio door and I was like, oh, it's smoky, I'll close the door. Mm -hmm. And I was like, but I mean, like, I'm like, I have the steak, so am I in a bad place, really? Exactly, yeah, <laughs> if the weather's nice, just just keep hanging. <laughs> can you Can you tell us what a day is like in the life of your job? Because I have to say of all the people that have been on the show, this might be the most interesting one. It is simultaneously the most and least interesting. Um, as, as you know, as, a, as both a technical person and a business person, the business side is 90% of what we do. It's just sort of shepherding people through conversations and replying to email and, and, you know, generally feeling busy and like you're never getting done while you're getting everything done all at once. Uh, I have a whole talk about people who want to start a hacker based sort of business and how to, how to be in tech. And that's, most of it is just boring things like that. Like make sure you pay the lawyer, do the books correctly. But the fun part, the 10%, the, the action-packed part of the job involves basically being like a sparring partner. Uh, people, people would go maybe watch a kung fu movie and they say, okay. wow, that's it. look at that person. They're beating everyone up. And I want to be that person. Well, in truth, most of the best-known names of martial arts, they don't think of themselves as people who just beat people up. They are known as and revered as people who know how to strategically and carefully throw punches and kicks at someone so that other person gets better. Their, their goal is not just to cause pain, their goal is to cause improvement. And that's really, if someone is good at this kind of job, what they should be thinking about. Uh, it's not my goal to just tromp my way through a, through a facility and run like, yeah, I'm the best, woo! I mean, a Polaroid of a person doing that could be a deliverable report for a lot of hacking people, right? Look at me, shells everywhere. I'd wrecked your facility. All right, next job. That doesn't really provide value to the client other than make them feel bad at everything that they're doing. Yeah. Our job is to, is to emulate an adversary and do it in a way that is realistic but digestible and then to walk people through what we did and hopefully make it harder for us to do that next time. So if I picked yeah. your locks, hopefully you're going to understand why these weren't the right locks. If compromise your access control system, hopefully you'll understand, oh, we should reconfigure how, oh, we have legacy credentials, let's turn them off. If we disable your alarm because we glitched the sensors, you're going to install different sensors or change how their, again, how their reporting window is. If we, you know, mm -hmm. let's say we uh, jammed the frequency if you're using wireless. Well, Maybe you need a little heartbeat signal, as it's called, so that every 60 seconds, those sensors check in. And if they don't check in, they register an error or an alarm condition. So next time we come back to that facility, all the things we tried shouldn't work. Shouldn't work. <laughs> How yeah. often is that true? <laughs> oh, it's a mixed bag. Some clients are, are absolute rock star clients, and they really implement everything really well. Uh, but those are sometimes the clients that put their budget into the improvements and then they, they say, all right, we're not gonna budget to have you back for a little while. The clients that just wanna kinda, all right, let's bring that team back. That was really fun when they were here, we liked them. Well, they didn't put budget in anything else. So all the same stuff, we've, we've, we've literally found, my favorite story, people talk about running an exploit and then you find your old payload like still on a server if you do networking stuff. Well, you know, we are, we're not ones and zeros as much as we are opening doors and opening boxes. The mm -hmm. idea of finding an old exploit, we actually found this records room in a client once and it had all these filing cabinets. We said, mm -hmm. okay, try and our, we have some, there's a whole like key ring of common keys. I'm holding up this, it's called, people call it the devious key ring now that, you know, I've mentioned like these keys are super reusable and maybe this is the key they're using for the filing cabinet, try it. Well, the common keys didn't work. We said, okay, oh, look, there's this key right here. Found it in a desk drawer. Oh, awesome. Open the filing cabinets, probably could have picked it anyway. And we're finding HR records and company history and all these financials. Well, it was in our report. We mentioned it to the client. To their credit, they tried to mitigate this. But what happened is they invited us to another facility in future 
and talk about finding the same vuln, they had literally freighted all of the filing cabinets to another facility, but it really wasn't locked up very well, and they were still the same filing cabinets. And we said, hey, do you still have that key from that last job? And we said, oh my God, this key, it's the same key. Oh my God, it's the same record. This is the same filing cabinets. All right, do we write wow. it up again? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so we're wow. trying. We have, a, we have a good question in the chat from mm -hmm. Dave. So cool. Does the Comp TIA Pen Test Plus help us learn from a physical security ethical aspect? Does it cover physical pen testing? To my knowledge, it doesn't speak much to what we do in granular detail. I know that Comp TIA and even you know CISSP, like physical is one of the domains that gets attention in texts. Yeah. And while in, in an ethical perspective, I'm very glad that he's mentioning, you know, how to do things ethically, because that doesn't get covered enough by many people in our industry. That was a yet another talk that I gave uh, at an event called Awareness Con. But um, the actual nitty gritty is focused in most standards we have seen more on the defender's sort of framework. You'll say, okay, well, like doors should have locks and sensitive areas should have monitoring. And you should, here's what you should do. It's very prescriptive. As far as I'm aware, none of the names most people have heard of before now focus on the adversarial side of it and really what people like us and bad people like us on the ground are doing. It's actually part of the reason why our firm, the core group, and another partner firm who works with us extensively uh, called Red Mesa, we combined along with a few other very notable people in the industry. Uh, Chris Nickerson is among them. Chris Nickerson created the pen test execution standard, right? So we've created something called Red Team Alliance. And in, in addition to a lot of training, it is a, an actual practical hands-on certification process. So if someone wants to actually say, yes, I am certified to do this, it's kind of one of the first avenues that exists for that. That's very cool. And for those of you that are listening only, um, <laughs> are there brass knuckles back there? Someone's commenting about brass knuckles just above oh, your yeah. head. They're, so they're not brass, they're actually cast iron because I touched them with a magnet recently and it turns out they are, they're, they're, these, are my, um, these are my grandfather's. They were found in his, in his possessions. They were, I think he probably bought them overseas when he was in the Navy, he probably would have bought those. This, this, this wall is a, it's an ever-growing array of, of odd things behind me. There's this, some people notice the fractured padlock in a frame. Uh, we were at our Virginia facility. And for anyone who knows, I can't imagine someone hasn't heard of a very, very fun YouTuber lockpicking lawyer. So he's also down that, that area. Um, he's a little outside of DC. He's a friend of ours, right? So he comes by the classroom every so often. And this was just, it was the last, thing I did before the pandemic. Uh, he was sticking around for a class of ours and he has this series of videos where he actually shoots essentially padlocks off of, you know, enclosures using a, essentially it's a very glorified nail gun. It's called a ram set. And people are like, oh my gosh, those ram set. I love those destructive videos of that ram set. It's even cooler than the picking. And he's like, well, I have it in the car. So yeah, he went downstairs, he got the ramp set and he was shooting locks off of this large wall and everyone kind of, okay, ears. And this, the one he did, I mean, it was like when anything bad happens, they say it happened in slow motion. And sure enough, I watched this lock ricochet hard off the stairs and come jitterbugging right at us. And everyone kind of ducks and I just kind of sway my head out of the way. And it was, it would have been me like right between the eyes. So it caught me right on the shoulder. I'm sorry, right on the elbow, right here. I don't think it, you can see it anymore. Is but it on the uh, yeah, bone? I was I was bleeding and just kind of packing it and wrapping it while getting messages from Tara saying things like, "Are you hang? I know that folk are there tonight. Everyone's in town. Usually you go out. It's bad. Things are like you should. The health reports are bad. Can you get on a plane? Oh. Can you change your flight? So I was like holding my elbow, changing a flight. Well, everyone's ears are ringing from this gunpowder blast. Uh, that was the last thing I did pre-pandemic. So we literally went out with a bang before the lockdowns. And Seattle was one of the first cities hit. So I was glad to be home. Oh, wow. So that's another yeah, I, I, That is a really good story and a good memento. 
Yeah, my last thing was going to um, RSA and then I came back and I had a cough mm -hmm. and then I had to go into quarantine and I was the first person on the island, I guess, in my city to go into quarantine <laughs> and everyone knew what to do with me. It was so funny. It took forever and I was fine. I'm but glad. I like your story better. Your story's better. <laughs> so I feel like, so a lot of times when people talk about like different jobs and stuff, they act as mm -hmm. though it's all the super glorious stuff that you see in movies. So like the hacker like clicks three lines of code and then he magically has everything. And it's like, no, actually when I did pen testing, it was like me really cold in data centers, swearing at my computer a fair bit and yeah. trying to carry so much heavy equipment as like a tall skinny lady. And so, and there's like a lot of patience and then eventually you find something and you're like, yes. And then mm -hmm. I'd be like, but I have six more hours in this freezing cold room. And so what is it, what types of personality traits, I guess, does someone need to be good at your job? Cause I'm assuming that patience might be mm -hmm. one of them. Yeah, patience, perseverance, positive mental attitude, probably some traits that don't start with P. But um, yeah, the, the, as you, you really, you nailed it in your description where you're sort of every job I approach, like I'm good at my job, my team is excellent. But every job, we're not trying to be negative Normans, but we're like, oh, this one's going to stink. Nope, this looks pretty hard. And you have to overcome that. You have to, you have to kind of say, uh, because you could treat it like just a playground. And be like, woo, but with, if it's devil may care and you just go tromping around, well, that's a recipe for getting caught and the job ending quickly, if that's what the client. Some frameworks of some jobs are first interdiction, the, the test is terminated. So you have to show a lot of care. You have to demonstrate really, you know, cautious planning. And once you finally get, as you pointed out, that first something to hang your hat on, something where you can say, all right, all right, all right, I can go home saying I did one thing right and it's not a failure of a job. <laughs> then, interestingly, that moment, and at least for me, you start to overcome all other hesitation. You're like, all right, well, now that I know I'm okay, what else can I try? You get a little bolder. And fortune does tend to favor the bold. The, the bolder you get, the bigger you go with the lie, in my case, the more you tend to have gains and the more you get into sensitive areas. So it, it, self, it self feeds. And by the end of the job, you're, you're running around in addition to waving at cameras, being like, I don't belong here. This is not right. Uh, and still not getting caught. And you're messaging the client. You're like, all right, people still haven't found us yet. Want us to start doing stupid stuff? <laughs> like, yeah, we took like a oh whiteboard off a wall once and put it on a, a rolled in office chair in front of the camera by the data center door and wrote in big letters, like, we are breaking in or something like that. And, and just kind of left it there. And I guess, you know, people don't really monitor cameras. Cameras are really for more for reconstruction. Wow. Okay. So, um, <laughs> sorry, I'm like, I'm supposed to ask more questions and not just mm -hmm. laugh. Um, <laughs> I want to take this moment to ask everyone to press the like button. If you are enjoying yourself, I know I've already pressed it. Um, so I feel like maybe there's more skills too that you would need, like, are there physical skills or technical skills? Like I would have to say that definitely um, for personalities, like wouldn't you need some social social skills? Like wh yeah. what happens when you get caught? So when you get caught, or we'll say when you get paused, because being caught is, is kind of different, right? Being able okay. to talk your way out of things, it comes up. Mm -hmm. And we, we have absolutely had situations where, you know, if you're with a teammate, and you know, here come the guards, because again, you've been setting off alarms. You're, you're really trying to, this was an instance I can recall, but we were really trying to push it at this point. We said, okay, let's open that door. That's gonna be a screamer of an alarm. Let's just walk through like it's normal. Then we're gonna go here and then we're gonna pop this door. And we, and sure enough, like we start hitting bam, bam, bam. And there are just, it's cacophony. I'm like, man, no guards yet. Well, they're going to come eventually. So I'm literally on my knees and I'm reefing on this other server room door with like an underdoor tool. And eventually, oh, we got two guards. It was a big warehouse. So we finally, Robert. So these two guards walk up to us and like, hey. Oh, um, your sound appears to be cutting out all of a sudden. 
and we just lost you. Yeah, we can't hear you at all. But I am going to put the good comment that he has a, a get out of jail training, and that seems really helpful. But you kind of popped Let's, on and off, yeah. and then you got. Oh, I'm I can here, hear you now. This? It actually it's good. said it's just, we have. Yeah. Oh, much better. Go ahead. Much, much better. Okay. Yeah, you sound good now. So, did you hear me say the you? guards were arriving or not? Nope. <laughs> so I, you know, my my partner and I in that job. You know, we had planned a course of progress guaranteed to set off alarms. And we're like, all right, in this door, I mean, this door is just going to be a blazing screamer of an alarm. And then we're going to trip that door. Okay. So we're in this very cavernous warehouse space and it is loud. And we're going, and we're like, there's got to be guards coming eventually. And eventually, sure enough, eventually these guards respond. And I'm literally on, on the ground at the foot of a door, like reefing on the door handle with an underdoor tool. And Robert, the guy who's with me on my team, is like, hey, man, we got company. I'm like, oh, okay, finally. We stand up. And we're just expecting this has got to be it. We've got to give this this facility a win, finally. And these guards say, hey, but hang on hang on a minute, fellas. Could you, you put that down for a second? Um, what are you doing here? And the way Robert tells it, I mean, he's got his hand in his pocket on his get-out-of-jail-free letter. that you, you know, It's your authorizing letter that makes sure you don't wind up in handcuffs. And he thinks, well, we got to be pulling these letters out. And just as kind of a Hail Mary, I just look at these guards and just deadpan. I go, what does it look like we're doing here? And it broke their brain. And when you think about it, if you found someone in your backyard and you said, hey, what are you doing in my yard? And the person panicked and ran and jumped over a fence and lost a shoe in the process, you'd be like, huh, that was a criminal. But if you found someone in your backyard, you said, what are you doing here? And they go, what do you think I'm doing? I'm a pretty private guy. I'm not even sure how I would respond, right? That's clearly a person who thinks they belong there, even if you don't think they belong there. So the guards kind of didn't, they looked at us, they looked at me, they, um, we got all these weird freaking tools. There's an alarm going off, but we had Photoshopped some badges because of telephoto photography of the badges and stuff. And he said, well, you got badges, so you work here. But was that an alarm? And we're like, oh, yeah, that was loud. Maybe we shouldn't have come in that way, I guess. What do you think? He's like, yeah, we're going to have to silence that. So, you know, he's next time if you need to get in the door, just radio us for remote unlock. You know? And Robert describes it as his hand on his on his letter just went, just kind of let that letter go in his pocket, took his hand out of his pocket, stood there. <laughs> so, yeah, being able to overcome a challenge. And this is, I never miss the opportunity to kind of, very much acknowledge the fact that I have the privilege to do this because I look like a middle-aged semi-derpy white guy, right? Like I am, I'm just a guy who vaguely belongs around a lot of spaces and I get that allows me to kind of just drift through life with a lot of low friction interactions with yeah. hoteliers or police or whatever. If people experience a lot of friction because of a lack of privilege, it's a lot harder to bluff and do that. That's not to say we don't have people on our team that are very diverse and can do a lot of different things, but that helps. Oh, me. Yeah. That helps me be, I mean, if, Hey, if I'm in overseas environments, sometimes, you know, if I'm in Asia, no one wants to question me, right? They, they, well, I don't want to tell that guy he doesn't belong here. He might outrank me. What if, what happens then? He's probably a visiting from another company. So you never know what's going to get you out of a circumstance, but uh, yeah, being able to think on your feet, that's Chris Nickerson. I mentioned it before. He tells a story where, He's, he's trying to get in a building saying he's there from the local power company. He's literally wearing a shirt that says Dominion Power, right? Mm -hmm. And somebody runs out of a data center with a problem expecting a visitor and goes, you, are you the, are you the guy from Liebert? And he's like, yeah. Okay, well, get in here. <laughs> so, sure, why not? I'm your Liebert. <laughs> sure. Just roll with it. <laughs> there, there's a really good question in the chat from Kellen. How do you document while you're doing a bunch of activity and interactions? Mm -hmm. Like, how do you keep track and like remember all the stuff? Yeah. So one of my favorite authors, his name is Bill Bryson, uh, in a book about travel, he mentions this one thing where he pulls up to his a house where he's staying with a family, but he said he talks about sitting in a driveway and finishing his notes before he goes. And you know, it's a long day, a long drive. You want to go inside. You want to have dinner. But the diligence to say, all right, I've got a pause, a pause point. 
let me rush, let me get some at least notes. Uh, that's one thing that helps us a lot. As you can probably already tell, like I'm a real storyteller. And as long as I have a framework of what happened, I'm really good at repopulating that and fleshing it out. So most jobs, especially when we have a team, or even if it's just me talking to the client point of contact, there's usually a signal chat going on. And the fact that it's timestamped, it's roughly in order, I can use that after the job to be like, hey, what was that thing you did with the, you took the badge reader off the wall and then the guy came up to you and you you told him you were installing a new one when you clearly went, what was, and he's like, oh yeah, that was building six. And I was like, you said, that was in the chat, right? I was like, oh, that was Thursday. You So you did that before we even had the badges. Got it. Now I'll write that up, you know? So having any kind of running log, even in the most sparse notes, helps me a lot. Um, and you're always trying to take, you know, some photos of good things to show the client. If, if anyone does any of this in the future, and if, even if you're just a client hiring a team to do a covert entry sort of simulation, uh, please try to build a day into the schedule where people don't have to be covert where they can just get credentials as guests, walk through and do their documentation so that your report, which is really what you're paying for, you're paying for the documentation, right? Um, is yeah. not a bunch of like grainy potato photos that are vertical. You know, people get the nice camera and they stand back and they take a photo of the door in situ. Uh, so yeah, being able to follow up your bad photos with much better ones, and that's what you deliver someone to the executives and such, that's it's it's all in phases, but for me, if I didn't have my notes and my a few crappy photos on the job, it would be hard because you say it's all this amazing rush of adrenaline and it's all happening at once. So yeah, write it down as much as you can. It's like coding, right? Comment while you go. You'll future you will thank you. Yes, future you in like a year from now will be like, oh my gosh, Tanya, what were you thinking? Oh, that's what I was thinking. Oh, that comment helped. Yeah. There is a question in or a comment in the chat. There are some cheap voice recorders on websites that you can stuff in a pocket. Mm -hmm. Good for capturing a running log, even if the audio is subpar. That sounds like yeah. a good point, William. Yeah, yeah. Voice recorders or even little tiny video recorders. Uh, clients can get twitchy about running recording, either video mm -hmm. or even audio. I mean, I'm not, I'm no lawyer, uh, but whether you fall into wiretap law or not is. Fortunately, not something we've ever had to face. Uh, yeah, but absolutely having little recorders. One of the best things we, cause we'll, we'll always try to steal radios when we can. So if we get into the guard shack and there's just like a bank of radios, well, you take one of them out of the charger. And then then you just leave that, leave that channel open and just start recording. Not only are you recording what their day-to-day -day operations are, but maybe you start actually get, we've got great footage on recording. Unfortunately, it's NDA'd, but it's, Things like where people started identifying something was wrong in the building, you know. Why is that door alarming? Yeah, is door 21 alarming again? I thought you just sent someone out there. What? Comcast is working in the building. I didn't know Comcast was working today. So it's like, oh, wow, that was us. That's kind of neat. <laughs> I've heard of some incident responders where they start like a new Slack channel or a new um, like team channel or whatever and name it for that date and just every single thing goes in there because they get like so excited about the stuff, right? And it's hard to keep mm -hmm. track of it. And yeah, when you're physically moving around, that's, that seems like it could become complex at times, especially with multiple teammates. Yeah. So, and then you all have to kind of shove all of your stories into the same story and mm -hmm. timeline. <laughs> Which I yeah. love writing okay. that. I, I honestly love report writing. I love crafting the, the whole narrative and, and putting it all together. You could write such an amazing book. Maybe. Okay. Maybe one day. <laughs> that would be so cool. But I, okay, I have more questions, Tanya. Stop mm -hmm. just talking, but do you do the questions? You can do this. Okay, so it feels like there's like a lot of technical skills that someone needs to be good at this job, right? More than just picking locks, there's a lot of stuff. What types of things maybe people would need to know? So yes and no. Um, I never want to dissuade anyone from any career choice when they when they think they need more than they actually need, right? So for instance, mm -hmm. I don't really program. Like, I mean, I can kind of do some Python, right? And I've written stuff in Arduino sketch. And that's about the limits of my programming skill. I don't do much beyond that. And yet I can attack an electronic access control system. I can attack a badge system. Um, 
if someone doesn't think that they're good, like, oh man, I see those lock pickers on YouTube. I could never do the stuff Dave does. Well, newsflash, neither can I. I can't do the stuff you think I do because I'm not nearly as good as the other friends of ours. So, you know, you've got Bosnian Billy, you've got Lock Being Lawyer, Fish Picks, Artichoke, all these cats. That's an amazing skill. It maybe features incidentally in what we do on a job. Most of what we do, we are generalists. We are people who can pivot quickly and use a little bit of expertise in many different domains and sort of fabric cobble together a solution to every barrier that we have to get around. It's it's kind of a lot of MacGyvering. That's, boy, how old am I with that reference, right? But Richard Dean Anderson's Canadian, I think, right? So there you go, one for the north of the 49th. Yes. I very briefly have to take a brief moment to thank our sponsor. Our sponsor for this episode and several episodes is 10 Security. Thank you, 10 Security. That is the, the people, the founders of Defect Dojo. So you can hire them to do consulting and they do awesome stuff and they use all of their awesome technical skills basically to automate all the boring stuff so that you can do the fun stuff. And so you can check them out at 10security.com. I also want to remind all of you that the We Hack Purple community is now free. So you can go to community.wehackpurple.com and um, my audio book uh, is available for pre-sale on audible.com and libro.fm and all the places where people buy audiobooks because it's by recorded books and they know what they're doing. So that's awesome. You can hear me read to you as you fall asleep. And hopefully that sounds appealing and not scary. And I feel like that's enough marketing for now. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yes. And also I'm supposed to also tell everyone about the OWASP course. So if you are an OWASP member, you get AppSec Foundations Level 1 for free now from We Hack Purple. And so um, you can go to wehackpurple.com slash blogs with an S, and it is our most recent blog post. And you just like click a link, and then you sign up with your OWASP email, and Bob is your uncle, and also you get free access to our course. So there's a lot of stuff, like the free Bob uncle is just a bonus. Thank you, Dave, for reminding me. Okay, let's go back to Deviant. Right okay. on. So, so I'm going to ask a super loaded question. Mm -hmm. How does, what types of training does someone need to get into this job? Like what education could they get? And I know you run a training company and you're totally allowed talking about it, but it just oh seems gosh. like you can't exactly like go to accountant school and become an accountant in the same way that it's not the same like that. In, in some ways, you're, you're correct. It's, there's a lot of experience that just comes into being, being cool under pressure. That's not an easy thing to teach in a classroom. It just comes with time. But the, you're, you're not wrong in saying that giving people an education, there didn't used to be a pathway to just, in, in the sense that if you wanted to do network and digital pen testing, we have really good training, right? We have certification. We we have you know I, the Sands Institute. I have tons of respect for the Sands organization and their GX cert. Right? They they have a real turnkey process to get people spun up uh, for physical that just didn't exist. That's why that's a, that's just again that's why Red Team Alliance kind of exists because we had a lot of people coming to us saying, you know, we've taken your you, you know black hat. We were at black hat a lot. We we run a black hat class. We're running a class this year, in fact, as always. And they would say, well, we we sent people through the Black Hat class, but it wasn't quite enough. Well, we just want to hire you anyway. Which, how many trainers at, at Black Hat really, I mean, I feel like a lot of people just use it as a marketing vehicle. Uh, my friend Caesar talks about how some Black Hat classes are just intentionally murky so that all you wind up doing is hiring the person at the front of the room. He says, here's my impression of a Black Hat trainer. No, 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 no. It's actually quite simple. Anyone who is me can do this. Uh, so... The the idea is we didn't want me. That. Yeah, we wanted to actually turn out students who could do what we are doing and were able to at least be dropped in into a job situation and would be capable. So that is, yeah, God, I'm so bad. I don't like talking about this stuff. It's very salesy. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at redteamalliance.com on the web if people want to know. I mean, that's the it's we have our own facility, right? It's not just a hotel meeting room, which you can only do so much in there. Uh, we have a building, right? We have a building with multiple rooms and offices and floors and all different locks on the doors, all different alarm systems. It's it's a practical training environment. 
And it's a small industry still. So people come through it and they say, this is great. Who's going to hire me? I'm like, well, all right, we can pass your name around. There's only so many people doing this, but it keeps going up. It keeps increasing. And we see a lot of people now training. It's really popular to train internal teams where if you're a big enough company, you don't want to bring in outsiders to maybe see all the dirty laundry, I guess. So they'll send people to us and say, well, can you train them to do what you did for us uh, you know, in the Colorado office? And then this people are going to go see all our other offices around the world. We say, yeah, we'll do that for you. Yes, I, I've had other uh, professors tell me they're like, you should go and train at the big conferences, Tanya, because then one of the students there will hire you to come in and train all mm -hmm. their software developers. And I'm like, oh, cool. Yeah. That is a really good plan because it like they send a student kind of to check it out and see if it's good. I'm like, oh, OK, well, this sounds excellent. Also, traveling's fun, like assuming okay. it's safe. But yeah, the idea of making it so that your students can't succeed without you, that sounds crappy though, no. I want to build AppSec engineers and that's what mm -hmm. we've been doing. We have Excellent. graduated hundreds now. And Excellent. yeah, I I can't see it. So like, I, I don't mean to sound pompous, but I really don't feel like I'm worried about, about like graduating a ton of students and then not being able to find work because there's too mm -hmm. many of them. I'm just like not concerned. I want there to be this huge army of AppSec professionals that go and secure all the things. Yeah. And like, that sounds like a, I want to be able to buy shoes safely on the internet or lock picks as the case may be. <laughs> same, same. Yeah. People, and some students say that, like, how are you training your competition? Or like, we're not, it's, it's like you're a fisherman training other people to fish. Like the, have you seen the ocean? It's huge. There's literally a phrase that says there's a lot of fish in the sea. It's that's a yeah. reason. Yeah, there's a lot of yes. work out there that needs to get done. Yeah, and I also feel like if you graduate tons of students who you've taught all of your special tricks to and like your methodology and like tried your best to make them kind of mini use, that then you get to go see that in the world, if that makes sense. Because I have seen AppSec teams where I'm like, oh, why are you so mean to all the devs? It's like you walk around with a stick just hitting people and telling them they suck. I, I saw a meme this week that said, are you even good enough to have imposter syndrome? And I was like, oh my gosh, that would be the type of thing that I could see. And so then I you know, try to teach a, a different, more empathetic approach. And so then I get to see that out in industry, right? And so. I'm sure that you don't want to be able to get into every building that you don't want to be able to, not that you do, but it's oh, nice yeah. to have security. The best job in recent memory was one that we were absolutely zapped on, like hard and quickly, because the company just had themselves together. The culture of security was very different than most clients. Oh, that's awesome. That is awesome. So I have I have more questions. So yeah, lay them on me. Well, I I'm gonna ask the cheese question because I know Ben is probably lurking somewhere on the chat and he's gonna be like, did you ask the cheese question yet? So the cheese question is so to give you a brief amount of back. I should have told you before, but everyone's heard this story 50 times. But when I was a software developer and I went to the grocery store, like a, you know a little while after being a dev. I was looking at two types of cheese and like trying to figure out like which one should I get? And I realized I now make enough money. I can just get both. And I don't actually have to count every single penny. I'm just totally going to go to the till and I got this for sure. Right. And that freeingness. And so then it started becoming the cheese question. Cause it's like, can you buy as much cheese as you want? Like, does this type of work pay well? And is there enough work? I guess, and please don't quote exact numbers. We had yeah, someone that wanted to tell us exactly how much money they made. I was like, please don't do that. Man, so I had not heard the question. And here I was thinking it was going to literally be like a cheese rank hierarchy. And I was going to start laying it on you with like. I, like if you want to tell me about your favorite green. cheese, though, because oh, I yeah. do really, really like cheese. Oh, for listeners who don't know, I'm I'm an OG Tanya fan. When when you and Phil wrote literally Cheese Party oh. as Couch Wrecked, oh, that's on my playlist. You better believe it. So yeah, the the do you make enough to get by? It, yes, I mean we do very well. That is partly a function of how ground floor we were in this field. 
I'm not saying we've been doing it as long as some folk. Uh, a wonderful example of that would be someone like Johnny Long, who's a marvelous presenter and everyone should listen to anything he's ever said on a stage. Uh, I mean, he was working for a firm called CSC almost a decade before anyone even talked about this publicly. So there are people who've been doing it longer, but being as prominent as we are, we get a good share of business for being a company that doesn't have a big sales arm. Uh, there are a number of firms now that just sort of mostly focus on network pen testing and network security, but they'll bolt on a physical to some jobs that, and they just train their army of salespeople how to, yeah, just pitch that. And then there's people kind of doing so, you know, like, they kind of like social engineering and they'll call it a physical on site. Um, but no, we, we are uniquely, uniquely enough positioned that I think we can buy all the cheese we need in multiple varieties. Someone who is just starting out is likely to like a starting salary. It's you're going to be a uniquely skilled individual. And if you are fortunate enough to land a job doing this, yes, um, the, the keys to cheese are then handed to you. Uh, but you are probably, I think a lot of people, because it's such a niche type of physical, you know, physical security is a niche industry, having any kind of other pen testing experience, understanding, you know, kind of Kali, understanding Metasploit, you're most likely going to be served well by that because a lot of firms who might hire you to do physical probably do a lot of other business in the network space. And if you have any of that as well, it's probably a help. Oh yeah, I, I've seen a lot of people that are just general pen testers and then once in a blue moon, they'll do a physical pen test. And I'm like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if they're gonna be as good at it as you are, but it's way better than if I came and did it because I would just be like, hi, can I come in? <laughs> You'd be surprised how well it works. I have had that work a lot actually. I went to see yeah. like this band I really like called Buck 65 once and I just talked my way in and they're like, oh, do you have a ticket? I'm like, no, I saw them last night in Montreal, but I liked it so much. I thought I would come tonight. They're like, but you don't have a ticket. I'm like, yeah, but I'm awesome. So you're gonna let me in. And after 15 minutes, they let me in and then they let me just take tickets and then they gave me merch. Like it was awesome. I'm a big fan. <laughs> so wonderful. That's wonderful. Yeah. It's very Canadian. He's Canadians. It's very Canadian of us anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's such a great answer. And I love that it's an honest answer because I feel like a lot of people think, well, I'm going to get this job and then money's just going to, or, or I'm going to get this training. Jobs will just rain upon me and I will magically have a lot of money. I feel like with security, the hardest part is finding that first job and getting some resume mm -hmm. experience. Right? Do you have any any tips for that? Which I realize is putting you on the spot, and that's hard. No, question. it's all right. Uh, but it's, again, I just there's there's a talk for everything. So there's a talk. Uh, I have a whole section on my website. Like just I added a page deviating.net slash human, which is just about soft skills and human. You know, not, it's not human hacking. This isn't social engineering. It's literally about yeah. career things. Uh, and I had a whole presentation yeah. about the what what qualities you need to think about when looking for a career in this field and how you present yourself and frankly uh, my illustrious and far more capable spouse is the person she's the expert on that right i mean her book women in tech is not just for women it is for all people uh, looking for a job seeking advice and how you negotiate and how you put yourself out there and I, I can never do the things uh, as do justice to everything she says in that but it like it has literally served me well I have that book and she signed it. Ooh, very, very um, awesome. And for everyone listening, it's deviating.net. So D E V I A T I N G dot net. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, we have a good question. So speaking mm -hmm. of your um, significant other, has Tara mm -hmm. ever been a part of your engagements? So um, one autocorrect nailed you there. It's Tara with an H. She's the, she's the unique, he's, not many people spell it that way, but at least you pronounced it Tara. Many people will say Tara because they're, they're being prim and proper, but he's Tara. So thank you for that part. Um, and <laughs> the only engagement uh, that Tara has been a part of with me has involved wearing of rings. So no, we have not brought her in <laughs> on a physical paying job. I feel like that was the best one for her to be a part of though, really. It's working out. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. 
Okay, so now I have super difficult questions. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not. Um, so what do you like the best about the type of work that you do? And then what do you like the least about the type of work that you do? See, so I'm, I'm always good for the one liner, right? So the funny answer, like, what do I like the best? Sleeping till 10 a.m. What do I like the least? Days I can't sleep till 10 a.m. Um, but the truth, <laughs> so the, we can we can broaden that out though, right? What I like is not really being beholden to any other firm because I, when I'm saying my work, most people think that I'm asking a question about like my career, like my on the ground with clients. I define my work as building and owning companies. Uh, so, and then there's part of that that's real. Like I really get to truly digest and feel inside when we deliver value. It's not just a pat on the back. Hey, good job. It's wow. I'm really, I'm seeing, I'm hearing from people days, months, weeks, years later, this is so great. Thank you. This is blah, blah, blah. So that's, I have a real ownership in that emotionally, but not being beholden to others, being able to just say, no, you know what? We're going to do it this way now, or we really need to start focusing on, on this. Uh, that's having that freedom is great. Having the freedom to, well, frankly, like when the team and I started the training center, like you can't just take off a week out of every couple months if you work a nine to five and be like, no, we're doing this other thing. It's going to have real ramifications. Trust me. Uh, so yeah. having that freedom to do new things and to have new projects, having the ability to, I mean, my YouTube channel is a silly sideshow in my life, but I probably would get heat for it from most, like if I had a boss, they'd be like, how much time are you spending on that? I'm like, far less than you think because it's a really low effort channel. But not answering to someone is great. The flip side, of course, is that there's, you don't just get to go camping and you can kind of be not working, but there's still the chance that someone's going to call and be like, hey, there's this thing that's on fire. Can you get on the phone for like a minute? Can you drive into town and get better signal to like jump on a Zoom? So you're never 100% not working. Uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that. I, I think I can balance it pretty well as evinced by my affinity for sleeping till 10 a.m. I do really like it on days where if there's no meeting, the night mm -hmm. before, I'm like, I'm just going to book it. And guess what? I'm just going to wake up whenever I wake up. Mm -hmm. Yes. I just, I like working really late. Um, I, you know, it's how I mean, Tara does it. So we, we, we kind of, my schedule's more human now. But um, I just like working when I can have like eight hours of uninterrupted, no calls, no emails, just silence. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's the best. Yeah. I, 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 I agree so much. Okay, so now I have another question that's slightly different. Mm -hmm. What gives you the most pride in the work that you do? What do you feel the most proud of? When seeing something to completion, which I describe as getting it out in the world in a way that it has its own wings and flies. Um, this, is, this is kind of the reason that I actually maintain that silly YouTube channel and GitHub and everything else. It's if I get hit by a bus tomorrow or I'm an American, right? So if I get hit by a bullet tomorrow, um, everything that I put out in the world kind of can just, all right, I, I left it all out there. I didn't leave like a drawer full of half finished projects and stuff that all this sunk cost that other people have to then do double work. Um, I'm a really big fan of just sort of Pareto optimal, 80%, just effing ship it, ship it and improve it later. Because getting it out there means someone else is running with it. It's it's kind of the reason that half the stuff we sell on our equipment shop, uh, if it's like the, the decoder card and there's other, these, I'm, my GitHub just full of all the design files. I'd rather it just be out in the world and, you know, something like, you're giving away your products. Well, no, I mean, people know how to brew beer but Coors still is making money, right? Yeah. So like people still buy stuff from our web shop, even though I'm just giving it away because I'd rather the information behind it just be out there so that someone else can pick it up and do the next cool thing with it that I'm gonna buy from them. I love it. Okay, so now the advice question, if you could give someone actionable advice to try to make some moves towards following similar career path to you, 
Mm -hmm. What types of advice would you like to give? Interesting. So it's so curious. Uh, I get this kind of question or versions of it a lot in email. It's what I call the what you do is cool, I want to do it too question. So much so that I have a blog post I put up. Maybe if you have show notes, we'll throw it in the, in the, in the show yes. notes, right? Yes. Um, and I haven't read that blog post in, in a, like a, a couple of years. So, man, what, what I, it's mostly just a story of me. Like, I'm actually just throwing it in your private chat here. Cool. Yeah, it was, it's really a story. It. It's, it's, I mean, it, it's like links to some of the videos I've been discussing and, and so forth. But really, it comes down to small bites of training and self-improvement. I can say that even as the owner of a company who does, I still do a lot of field work, right? Like I still go neutralize, I love the sanitized language of the safe, safe uh, cracking world, right? Neutralizing, I neutralize government safes on army bases, right? Uh, I still do that in the field. But even though, like, I still go down to Kentucky, I'll go to Lockmasters and take a training class once a year just to do something new. I will go and I will take a SANS class or I will take, I will I wish I could take a black hat class. Sometimes I'm always teaching during black hat. Right. But I'm always looking for something new, uh, something to keep your brain elastic so that you never mm -hmm. get just stuck in a rut. Um, if yeah. you're not learning a new skill, your employer, if you are a worker for someone else sees you as kind of like a, a one trick person, they kind of typecast you. Well, that's the person who does that thing. And even if you work for yourself, if all you do is what you already know, then you just become that person who only does that few things and answers a bunch of email. So adding new skills, even if you think, oh, there's no way I'm going to use this. Am I going to use this? Keeping your brain as elastic as possible by taking, take one training a year if you're an employee. And if you're a, an employer who really cares about your people, send them to one training a year. That's like one distilled nugget. That's the best way I can give you that. No, no, I love it. I definitely agree. I basically consume a ridiculous amount of audiobooks per month. And mm -hmm. then I have like a pile of physical books like sitting all around me with highlighters where I'm like, oh, yeah. Um, cause, cause you take that knowledge and it ends up going into all these other things that you do that make mm -hmm. you better, even if it's at, better at the thing that you're the expert at. That's such good yeah. advice. And when you um, see famous people sometimes take heat because like that person's, how can they be governor of that state? Do you know they're an economist or they're a whatever, they owned a construction firm. How are they mayor? Well, all those different skills they inform, like, yeah, the mayor's not out there swinging a crane around, but they probably learned a lot of things in that field and that discipline that they're applying. And if you, again, if you take training, it opens up new ways of thinking and approaching problems. Yeah. It's going to sound weird, but as a software developer, I ended up getting to learn a lot about whoever I was making the software for. So I did software for like industrial, not industrial control systems, but like um, bills and materials and things like that. And then mm -hmm. for scientists and then for people managing top secret evidence, et cetera, et cetera. And I ended up learning a lot of little bits of a whole bunch of things and I have a lot of random knowledge up here. Yeah. I so, think we had one more question that kind of blew by us there. What was that about? Oh, so um, someone was, they're talking a lot about waking up in the morning. <laughs> they're talking a lot about like when they like to wake up early or not wake up early. And, um, and then William talked about, I learned many years ago to send myself on training out of mm -hmm. pocket each year. And that is actually the reason I started speaking at conferences because I couldn't afford to get in to all the ones I wanted to go to. So I was like, well, I have lots of spare time. So I will just write conference talks and apply to every conference I wish I could go to. And then some of them started saying yes. And I was oh, yeah. just like, holy crap, I'm getting into this conference. This is amazing. Um, and that is part of why I still apply to specific conferences because I want to go and learn from all those people. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, okay. So the last question, because we're supposed to wrap up theoretically, blah, 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 podcast under an hour, get more play. I don't know why. Um, but so 
If people want to know more about you, because I'm assuming they're going to, what mm -hmm. are all, all the places I should send them? So we should send them to your Twitter. So I'm just going to put that on the screen for a second. Mm -hmm. So at, so at Deviant Olaf, but it's spelled so at and then Deviant, like you would think, mm -hmm. D-E-V-I-A-N-T. But Olaf is the way you say it. It's spelled O-L-L-A-M. And that's yeah. all one word. It is Celtic. So well, if you can spell it right once, you can spell it right everywhere. It's that first hurdle. Getting over that, uh, if people can do that with the O-L-L-A-M, uh, then they can find me similarly spelled on, on that old YouTube uh, where I have no rhyme or reason to the channel and the viewers are like, you should start a second channel for stuff that's not X. And I'm like, you don't understand the purpose of this channel. It's for me, not you, Broseph. Um, and, you know, <laughs> there's Instagram, which I mostly just use for liking and affirming other friends' life choices about cats and food. Uh, there Those is are important there choices. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hi right? Highly, way better than anything technical. Um, there's, a, there's a GitHub, doesn't have much on it, but, you know, any projects I have that I care about, I'm actually probably going to push something up there for Monday's video uh, having to do with these oh. leashy lock picks, uh, if I can get that up there. Nice. Um, where else am I? I got to be somewhere else on the internet, right? There's oh. enterthecore.net. That's true. That is that is the company uh, of which I am at the helm with another guy named Babak Javadi. So if you, if you want to pay us money, I guess, and we can tell you how things look on your facility, by all means, come find us. If you'd rather have other people pay you money to do that kind of job, there's, of course, redteamalliance.com. Come in the classroom and then do do what I do, but probably better and better looking than me. I, I don't know. We'll see about that. <laughs> Thank you so much for being on the show. This is really great. I feel like you gave such good advice in regard to, like, how people can learn and a lot about like how you have to have patience and all of those other things. I think that sometimes people look at stuff they see in movies and they're like, I could totally do that. And it's like, no, it's not at all like the TV show Archer. It's very different. That guy would be dead mm -hmm. the first 10 seconds of every single thing they go into. Um, yeah. <laughs> the only thing accurate about Archer is the prolific use of whiskey. Yes, I agree. I agree. There's your security yes. right there. <laughs> I was actually, I give, there was some in, in the no, chat I have, asking I have to about give props it. To, yeah, props to Val Thomas, who's another amazing physical penetration person. She she did give me this sticker for my for my coffee mug. This I don't amazing drink coffee. whiskey. <laughs> it's not whiskey, though. I love it. I love it's actually, it. It's actually beer. <laughs> <laughs> I respect that. I respect that. Yeah, that would be a big cup for whiskey, but no judgment here. Thank yeah. you so much for being on the show. This was really fun. And for everyone who liked Deviant, follow him on all of the stuff. Go check out his YouTube because there are a lot of fun videos like where he breaks into an elevator, where he breaks into a bank, where he breaks into a walk, where he breaks, you get the, there's like a trend there. Um, <laughs> and uh, people really like the sticker. So thank you Excellent. so much again for being on the show. And uh, we will see all of you next week for the We Hack Purple podcast. This week, our guest, Deviant Olaf, was amazing. He talked all about physical penetration testing and also about his training company and how he offers training in that. And that's awesome. Sauce sharing the knowledge. We were sponsored this week again by 10 Security. Thank you so much, Defect Dojo creators. You guys are so great. We really appreciate you. I want to tell you one more time that Alice and Bob Learn Application Security is now out in audiobook format in all the places where they sell those things. You can pre-order it now, and it actually goes live on the 27th of July. So you only have to wait around six more days. And visit all of Deviant stuff. There is more stuff. Oh, yes. we have. We Hack Purple has a partnership now with the OWASP Foundation, and we are giving away our 
Application Security Foundations Level 1 to people with an OWASP.org email address, which means you are a member. So go check it out on our blog. And the Secure Coding course is still available. It is full price now at $249 and people are still buying it. Thank you very much. If you want to learn secure coding in an agnostic way, so we're not teaching specific languages, we're teaching good rules for every language, and then we're going to deep dive into different languages, please go check it out at academy.wehackpurple.com. And last announcement, I swear, community.wehackpurple.com is now free. The best way to get in is to have someone refer you. So if you have a friend that's in there, ask them to invite you. But if not, you just go, you click the join button, you answer the questions, and then I kind of sniff you out and see if you don't seem like a creep, and then we let you in. I hope to see you there. I am Tanya Janka, and I am your host, and I'm so glad you joined me. Thank you very much. See you next time. Thank <laughs> you.